from ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore. Trembles at his voice and trembles at 
presence of the living God, as we catch a glimpse of who he is and all that he does, as we sense and know and trust that he is here. We praise you for who you are and all that you do. I just want to give you just one moment. You need to close your eyes. Whatever it is you need to do. Remind yourself that you are in the presence of the living God. As we're two or more gathered, he said he'd be there. So I think we've got to cover it. And he rides upon the praises of his people. Forgive me for keep repeating, but you guys sound so great on that simple, familiar song. Could we just do it one more time, then sings my soul? from the top of your lungs, from the bottom of your heart. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. 
How great Thou art, how great Thou art. What you said, though the storms may come, though the winds may blow, I may sacrifice and let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. And great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. Though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. The history can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. From the storms may come, though the winds may blow, I may stand fast and let my heart learn when you speak a word. It will come. To the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me.
into the setting, saying I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Lord, you've been faithful to a thousand generations, to every generation. Since the moment you spoke and there was light and there was life, to the moment that you said the word will become flesh, to this very moment, Lord, you have been faithful. And you are the promise keeper the keeper of your promises. Sometimes they don't show up as we think, Lord, and we surrender to your will and to your ways. And we say hallelujah. Praise will be our song. you would pour your spirit out. You said that you would fall on sons and daughters. So That you would pour your spirit out. You said that you would fall on sons and daughters. So, like the rain of your anxious in love, let your glory rush in like a flood. And we
say yes to you. We're reminded of the scripture that says that if we ask the Holy, if we ask the Father for the Holy Spirit, how much will He give? That He will give them to us. And Lord, in this moment, we ask for more of the Holy Spirit in this place in our lives that You may lead us. Pray these things in the precious name of Jesus, our Messiah, the way, the truth, and the life. We say amen. I want you to say hello to the people you're worshiping with. those of you who don't know me, my name is Kylie, and I'm one of the youth pastors here at Cornerstone, and we are glad that you are here with us today. And if you are joining us for the first time, or you've been coming for a couple weeks but haven't had the chance to really connect, we would love to meet you. You can text I am new to the number you see on the screen, or you can come out into the info desk in the lobby and say hello. Now, we have some really sweet events coming up. This week, our men have our first Wednesdays, and then after that, it is full-on Christmas mode. Next Sunday at 5.30 is our family Advent open house, where there will be appetizers, hot chocolate, desserts, Christmas activities, and crafts, and anyone and everyone is welcome. And then right after that, at 7 p.m., is our night of carols, where we will all gather and sing carols together. And you can find details, information, and registration on our Christmas at Cornerstone page on our website. And now I am honored to be the one to light this first Advent candle of hope, that it's tradition that the four weeks leading up till Christmas, you light a candle. And really, the candle is just a remembrance and help us to celebrate and remember that we do have hope in the world because of Jesus. And as we look at this, we can remember that. And if you've not received our Advent devotional, we'd love for you to follow along with us. You can text Advent, the number you see on the screen behind me, or you can download it on our website as well. And thank you for your continued generosity, that your year in giving makes our Advent giving possible each year. And I'm gonna welcome up Gene as he is going to share with us our second Advent giving recipient. Thank you, good job. All right. So most of you know that for over a decade now, we at this time of year during Advent, we find uh, typically four organizations to give a grant to. And we gave one out last week to the Boulder Pregnancy Resource Center. Um, and that amount this year is $10,000 per organization. And um, this is Christy Gilbert, good friend of mine and a tender of, of Cornerstone. She works alongside me uh, helping our refugee family this year. So Christy is with the Colorado Immigrant Justice Fund, which is our second recipient this year. Tell everybody a little bit about that organization. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Can you all hear me? There you go. Good. Um, so I represent the Colorado Immigrant Justice Fund, which is an organization we started, my friends and I started visiting people in detention in Aurora. There's a detention center for immigrants. Um, treated like prisoners, it's, like, it's a prison, there's no getting around it. And these folks are in detention and they do not have a right to attorneys. So what we do is we provide legal funds to get them attorneys. And the fact is there's about 5% you know, chance of somebody getting asylum if they don't have an attorney and they just don't have that right. So we visited them, I made friends with one Celestin who watches this from Dallas, Texas. Um, he's a cornerstone remote. Yeah, we actually had Celestin up on the screen uh, a couple years ago, and we were still back in that room there, so some of you might remember him. Yeah, he was the first person I met. He's like a son to my husband and I, and we're still in touch. His family is getting ready to come out here after two years. Our first person that we helped just, it's been two years, Selkie is his name, from Cameroon. He and Celestine are both from Cameroon. If they went back, they would be killed. And a lot of these people, if they don't get asylum and they get deported, it's a death sentence. 
So we feel strongly about this. We're inspired. We're back visiting people in detention. If anybody's interested in that, we stopped for right after we launched our fund. Um, COVID came, and we started a pen pal program, and then we just got lots of requests from around the country. So not only are we serving Colorado, but we're also serving underserved areas like Louisiana, who nobody ever gets to gets asylum. So we've been able to do a lot, and I'm so thankful and grateful to you guys for doing this. This is just awesome. Yeah, actually, the next, starting today and the next two, are all people here from Cornerstone who started Somehow we're involved in starting a nonprofit in, under uh, the justice banner. And so we are happy to present you with $10,000. Any thoughts about how you might use this? Yes. Um, we actually, <laughs> of course, <clears throat> we have a volunteer team. As a matter of fact, I don't know if Kathy Appleton is here today. Kathy, she is um, our, our uh, accountant, CFO, volunteer um, We'll give her that money to deposit. She also helps an organization that we also support in San Diego. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we're gonna, we've got a family we're looking at. We've never done an entire family before. And mm. we're, we've got an attorney lined up, and we think we're going to be able to use about half of this for that. Awesome. So we're excited about that. It's good work that you do. Thank you. So proud of you. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you so much. And um, we're so impressed with people who, you know, they hear us teach all the time and we're actually involved in justice here at Cornerstone that we're so proud of people who hear that call in their own life and then start an organization. And that's why we're, we're going to bless uh, the next two over the next couple of weeks. I want you to know that I have a blank one of those fake checks at home right now. And um, if you have already started an organization under the uh, nonprofit under the Justice Banner, or you've been thinking about starting one, I want you to contact me at our email, justice and, minister, at justice and mercy at cornerstonebowler.org, and let me know what you're thinking because we're, we're going to have kind of a little contest uh, to give some seed money to organizations that uh, are either existing here already or you're thinking about. So do that, okay? Love to have, have uh, to bless you with one of those fake checks too. I don't know how much you get at the recycle for that, but that's, <laughs> that's what you get. <clears throat> now, you all know that um, I like to think of history in the Bible as one incredible action-packed story that God conceived of before the beginning of time. You've heard me talk about that. Genesis 1-1 is the beginning of that incredible moment when God presses the play button and his story, his story, his story springs to life. Bereshit bara Elohim ve'at shemayim ve'at ve'et ha'eretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when I talk about history in the Bible as a story, I often say, like it or not, you and I and everybody else who has ever lived and will live are kind of stuck in this crazy God-inspired epic tale. King David said in Psalm 129, 139, 16, he says, all the days, all the days, not some of the days, but all the days ordained for us were written in God's book before one of them came to be. And of course, this incredible passage tells us that when God created this or wrote this story, he included you and I and everybody else. We all have a role to play in this epic tale. And one of the things I find absolutely fascinating, I'm hoping that you'll think it's fascinating too, otherwise you're going to go to sleep, is that when God created the universe, he built into the universe a plethora of governing laws that impact our lives daily. For instance... The law of gravity. Gravity is what keeps us all from floating off into space. If we didn't have gravitational pull, you would just drift away. Or it keeps us from jumping off a really high cliff without a bungee cord or a parachute. And all of this, it's not like we sit around. I mean, how many of you sit around and think about gravity? Only John Mayer does that, right? <laughs> For us, it's just, it's just intu we're intuitive. Um, it, as we just go about our lives. And 
even though we rarely give it a second thought, we still are forced to respect its boundaries or our role in this crazy story is going to come to a crashing halt. And what about the law of time? Did you even know there was such a law? The law of time. We could destroy all the clocks uh, and watches in the world and it still would do nothing to slow down time or to stop it. God built into our world a day that um, resets about every 24 hours, a year that resets about every 365 days. And like it or not, we're all stuck in the never-ending grip of time. We have to get to work or our kids to school on time. We have to pay our bills and our taxes on time. We have to end this service on time. Otherwise, my boss, Brian back there, he hates it when I say that, right? He said that last week. He gets really upset. He has a really bad temper. I don't know if you know that or not. We're working on that. And because everything's like on, needs to be on time, it just, life can feel like just one big deadline after another with very few breaks in between. And just for fun, God threw in aging into the time equation as well. Every tick of the clock makes our skin a little wrinklier. I don't even know that's a word. And our hair a little grayer or less. And even though we can spend lots of money today trying to slow down the aging process, there's really absolutely nothing we can do to stop it. How about the law of survival? I spent the last two weeks fighting off a band of rogue influenza A viruses who thought it would be a good idea to launch a hostile takeover of my body. <laughs> and there we were, locked in a battle of survival. Who would win, them or me? And thank God for Grandma Ray's chicken soup recipe, what we Jews call Jewish penicillin. It sent those nasty parasites packing right to virus hell. So every, li every living organism on this planet is competing to survive because God built the law of survival into the universe. And so here we all are, stuck in this crazy story, trying to avoid falling off a cliff, coping with that stupid clock that just won't stop ticking, tick, 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 hoping that we won't get consumed by another living organism that's only trying to make it through the next day. And this morning, I want to talk about yet another governing law that God built into the universe, and it's called the law of power, which is also the title of this message. And when I say power, I'm not talking about the kind of power that's found in coal or fossil fuel. I'm talking about the kind of power that's found in human relationships, something a lot of people today call social power. Philosopher Bertrand Russell once said, the fundamental concept in social science is power in the same sense that every, in which energy is the fundamental concept in physics. It's an awesome quote. Social power is the force that regulates human relationships. And the moment God created a second human being, power, or the lack of it, became the relational dance that we do from that point on. Think of social power this way. There are only two kinds of people in the world, okay? We'll just keep it really general and simple. Those who have power and those who don't. And if you're a skeptic about this relational power, I suggest you do this social experiment, okay? Write it down. I suggest you do this. Find two really adorable and very compliant toddlers. Okay, they need to be adorable and compliant. Put them in an empty room facing each other, only a few feet apart. Then take some kind of an object, like let's say a toy fire truck, and put it in between them, and then leave the room, but observe through the window what happens. How many already know how this experiment is going to go? Ooh, a fire truck. I'm going to pick it up and play with it. No, you're not. It's mine. What? No, it's mine. Mine! Mine! And, you know, without 
parental intervention, it wouldn't be long before this relationship, this becomes a relationship in balance, where one toddler is becoming the dominant force while the other is becoming the weaker force. One might grow up to have a bully, entitled mindset, while the other might grow up to be a victim, have a victim unworthy mindset. And most of this imbalanced dance of power gets established at a very young age. You know, like on the school playground. <clears throat> Anybody a teacher here? I know we have lots of teachers. Is it still as brutal on a playground as it used to be? I think it is, yeah. Or even in, in um, you know, unsupervised, unsupervised playgroups where kids can just go have at it. It, it gets developed really early. Well, welcome to the law of power. Today is the last message of our Dear Corinth series, and I want to use our final passage this morning to shine what I believe is a bright light on the role social power plays in the world because as a church, like Cornerstone, that is very involved in justice work here and around the world, most of the injustices that take place are a direct result of an imbalance of relational power between those who have the power and those who don't. In fact, most relationship struggles in our marriages, in our friendships, in schools, in our workplace are also due to imbalances of power. And so this topic becomes hugely important, especially for those who are followers of God, because God is a God of justice. And this topic is addressed quite often in the Bible. And if we would simply live biblically, relationally, we would have a power path that is nothing short of revolutionary in the world from all the other power paths. So let's go down this path together, okay? And here's our final text. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I thought I brought up my water bottle. Can you, can you hand me that, Christy? Thank you. Oh, it's one of the things that has been so bad being sick. I just, my mouth just gets super dry. I'm not sick anymore, but I'm super dry. Mm. I, don't, I found this cup in the kitchen cupboard here. I don't know who it is. It's got these cute little pictures of doggies and cats on it. So if that's yours, you can claim it later. Okay, it was already full of water, too. So. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. This is the uh, Rabbi Saul, or the Apostle Paul, speaking. In order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest upon me. And Paul's referring here to an experience he once had where he was transported into the kingdom of heaven where he had what he calls an inexpressible sacred experience. If you read the chapter just before this text, no words, just absolute silent amazement and awe. Every once in a while, we humans get to experience the closeness of God through a moment in space and time that some call a thin place. When the distance between heaven and earth becomes narrow. And when that moment takes place, we experience the power and the presence of God in very profound ways. For many, it happens right here in this worship, worship service for Others, it happens during your prayer time, or for others, it's while you're standing on the peak, one of those 14,000-foot peaks on the Continental Divide. Now, imagine being able to travel all the way through the thin space, right into the very presence of God. That's what happened to Paul. And so it's not difficult to imagine that an experience like that could easily manifest into some kind of a very puffed-up ego. I met with God face to face, man. I am so spiritual. I'm so, I'm so much more spiritual than all of you. In fact, you may now donate to my I'm special fun. Okay? And so being the one who invented the law of power, 
God didn't want Paul to return feeling that he was now above anyone else <clears throat> and become a spiritual kind of a playground bully, so to speak. And so to prevent this from happening, God gives him some kind of a, a thorn in the flesh that Paul says is a messenger of Satan, a bad guy angel, whose sole job is to stay stuck or close to Paul's side and mess with Paul's life in a way to keep him humble. Paul doesn't like this arrangement, and so he says three times, I pled to take it away, which means really a million times. But listen again what God says to him. He says, no, Paul, I, I'm not going to do that. My grace is all you need. That's enough. Because my power is made perfect when you're weak. Boom. <laughs> Mic drop moment. Now, before we dig a little deeper into this, what this passage means, I want to show you, these are all mine, so um, this, this, I'm not digging into anybody else's material here, so this is just mine here. What I think are the three primary relationship powers that we find in the world today. Number one, we're going to look at the posture of overpower. And then number two, we're going to look at the posture of leveling power. And number three, we're going to look at the posture of underpower. So let's look at this first one, the posture of overpower. And to begin with, it's important for us all to know that this model, the overpower model, is the most popular model used in the world, and it's the most valued model used in the world. At its core, it just means there's a top authority Where in any given relationship, you know, there's someone at the top of an org chart somewhere, and then there's everybody else below. And that's why I call it overpower, but you can also use it as overpowering as well, okay? <clears throat> and we see this model everywhere in society. In the business world, a CEO. In a marriage, most of the time, it's a husband. In church, it's the lead pastor. At school, it's the principal. In sports, it's the coach. If you involve with the mafia, then you know it's a don. In the cartel, it's a drug lord. In prostitution, it's the pimp. This is the primary and most valued model in the world. And you may recall that when ancient Israel entered the promised land, they faced multiple formidable enemies at just about every turn, and they felt powerless in most of those battles. Samuel, the prophet, was their leader back then, but he didn't lead from the top down. He always consulted God. It was a theocracy. And his adult children uh, came to help him, but they were not very godly. And so at some point, the people say to him, this is 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 5, they say, hey, Samuel, you are old. See, that's what Brian said to me about four years ago. You were wrong to say that, Brian. Okay. <laughs> you are very old. And your sons do not follow your ways. So. Now appoint a king to lead us. And listen to this. Such as all the other nations have. Samuel doesn't know what to do. So as usual, he consults God about it. And God reluctantly allows him to install a king to reign over them. But he warns the people about it. And this is 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 11 through 18. I'll just read a few things here. He, this is his warning. This is God's warning. This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his right. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses. With his chariots and horses. They will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands, commanders of fifties, others to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards. You see where this is going. I mean, this, you want a king? Okay, I'll give you a king. But you're not going to like it. This is not God's best. But I'll let you have it. Okay. So if you know your Bible at all, you know that Saul becomes the first king of Israel, and he's a horribly dysfunctional person. 
who does everything that God warned them about, and more. Stephen Taylor, uh, who's a PhD and author of When Democracy Fails, says this about overpowered leaders. He said, throughout most of recorded history, one of the human race's biggest problem has been that people who rise in positions of power tend to be pre- precisely the kind of people who should not be entrusted with power. Desire for power correlates with negative personality traits such as selfishness, greed, and lack of empathy. So the people who have the strongest desire for power tend to be the most ruthless and least compassionate individual. And here's the key part to take away. Once they possess power, they usually devote themselves to entrenching, increasing, and protecting their power with scant regard for the welfare of others. What's the takeaway here? Number one, people who rise to position of power are often dysfunctional people. Number two, once they're there, they spend most of their time trying to stay in power. You can see this, right? And I'll add that they often use tactics like intimidation, fear, spinning or limiting information or facts, dehumanizing people who oppose them, bribes, and often violence and imprisonment to stay in power. You can see tactics like this used by, this is used by people like Adolf Hitler and demonizing certain people groups like Jews and gays. Did you know that he demonized gays as well? He put gays to death in ovens as well. And lots of other people groups that he considered to be subhuman. China and Iran right now using violence and imprisonment to crush peaceful demonstrations, shakedowns by the cartel in Mexico, fact-twisting and dehumanizing in our American politics today, abusing power and wealth to manipulate underage women for sex, like R. Kelly and Jeffrey Epstein, pimps beating up their prostitutes if they don't turn enough tricks for the day, One spouse spouse using domestic violence to keep the other spouse paralyzed by fear. And most of these examples I'm, I'm giving are extreme, but I believe it helps to look at extreme examples to recognize how power imbalances work in our lives and to recognize them. And it's not like every person who gets into a position of power ends up being a dysfunctional person who abuses their power, because there always have been caring and benevolent people who rise to positions of power. Not all the kings of Israel abuse their power. But in reality, the truth is the vast majority of kings did. Including King David, by the way, who used his power to lure a married woman to have sex with him and then had her husband killed so that he could take her as his wife. I should mention that Dave already had five wives at the time, which makes sense that he had a son that had a thousand concubines. So ironically, all of these kings, including King David and Solomon, were typically devout Jews who kept the Torah, which shouldn't surprise us because how many times do we read about devout pastors today who end up abusing their top-down power with women and often those women are minors. It's just, it's, just a, it's just a dysfunctional model. And it's important to understand that the top-down power models has major flaws and weaknesses that can create very dysfunctional imbalances of power, which is very problematic for our world today since there's, it's still the most popular and valued model. Okay, the second model I call the posture of leveling power. And it's a much better model. The goal in this model is to equalize power imbalances by leveling the playing field, so to speak. In other words, by raising up people who have less power, those who are weak and vulnerable and abused, um, to the same level of power as those who have it over them. And you can, you can recognize this model when you hear terms like today, like so, social justice, racial justice, equity, human rights, those kinds of things. Um, And in Deuteronomy 16.20, we see this verse 
where God says, follow justice. It's the Hebrew word zedek. And justice, zedek alone. Why? So that you may live and possess the land the Lord has given to you. This idea of justice, particularly in the Jewish world, it's like it's, it, the word zedekah, which, which is a longer version of the word zedek. It's like the first word a baby says, you know, zedekah. Because it's so ingrained within the Jewish culture that you do, that your life is one of generosity, and particularly to those who have less power. And we see this, because passages like this in the Bible, we see this leveling power throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, the Torah, you know. You see why this is so important to God. God says he's a God of justice several times in Scriptures. And then in the Torah, there are commandments that match his heart of justice, like that you should have honest scales, right? You shouldn't have one set of weights for one group of people and another set of weights for another group of people. Everybody should have equal weights on their scales, right? Uh, He talks about equal wages for people. It doesn't mean that you don't give a, a higher wage for somebody that does, has a greater work, but people who, who do the same kind of work should get the same kind of pay. You shouldn't pay one group of people, particularly those who you would consider lesser in society, a lower wage, and other people a higher wage. Or one wage because somebody's male, and another wage just because somebody's female. The Torah talks about equal judgments in the courts by judges. You can't have one judgment for for minorities and another judgment for people who are mainstream. We still see that as a problem today. Um, And honest testimonies in court. So it's just God's character of justice in equalizing and leveling the playing field is seen all the way through it. There's this Jewish group called Chabad, it's like a sect, a Jewish sect. I love Chabad. They, they um, actually, if you're, if you're on Instagram or TikTok, you should get on Chabad's channel because you'll learn a lot about great things. But they, they write this. They say uh, Zadik, which is, Zadik is like a righteous person, you know? Like if you, if you do acts of righteousness, you're called a Zadik. Noah in the Bible is called a righteous person, a Zadik. Zadik is a form of Hebrew word zedek, which carries the meaning of doing what is correct and just. And so weights that are calibrated correctly are called monse, mosne, zedik. Uh, just, you know, that's where you, you'll see that in the Torah and the scriptures. A judge is urged, zedek, zedek, you shall pursue justice, justice. Uh, in other words, that what was wrong should be righted. That which was stolen should be returned to its owner. The innocent should not suffer, and those who have caused harm shall be corrected so that they will not return to doing good. So deck is making everything the way it should be. So too, the personality of the Zadik, the person who does righteous, is calibrated to the manufacturer's original specifications so that everything about him or her is just as the creator meant it to be, should be, and all he desires is what his creator desires. A Zadik is one who embodies the creator's primal conception of a human being. And so this is all referring to the model of leveling power and what an incredible world this would be if we all lived this way, right? But you need to know that as good as this model is, it still falls short of God's best and most valued model, which is our last model to look at this morning, and that's called the posture of underpower. Underpower. This is the kind of power God was referring to in our passage this morning. A a power not built upon our strengths and our ego, one that's built upon our weaknesses. Why? So God's power can be channeled through us. This model is built upon humility and sacrifice. It puts the needs of others above our needs so that they can develop and succeed as highly as possible in areas of their life. A power down model is the goal (laughs) 
I'm sorry, in a power down model, the goal is not leveling the field. Because in God's model of fairness, just making vulnerable, poor, powerless people are equals doesn't go far enough to balance the scales. Now, I'm not saying anything that's not in Scripture. You can test me out on this. In a power down mo- model, the goal is not equality or leveling the f- field. The goal in underpower is to raise others up above ourselves. And the worship team can come up. And prayer team, too, would you come down, too? Because there might be some people that want prayer during this last song. Mark 10, chapter 42 through 45 Jesus called his disciples together, and he called them together because they were arguing about who's going to be first in the kingdom of God. And he says, you know, those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. They overpower them. They have a top-down power motto. They lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. It's not going to be your model. When he says it to them, he's saying it to us too. This is not to be our model. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In this model, those in the world who are last, the weak, the vulnerable, the poor, the abused, the oppressed, the marginalized, they need to be lifted up above us. And we are never in a more powerful position to affect change than when we lower ourselves to raise others up. And what is this model based upon? For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to what? And to give his life as a ransom for many. So let me read the same thing through the lens of the letter to the church in Philippi. This is Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 through 9. Do nothing. I looked that word up in the Greek, that word nothing. It means nothing. It does, Nick. It means nothing. <laughs> so that's a high bar, right? I mean, it's God setting a super high bar. Do nothing. Now, I'm not there yet, so I'm, believe me, I'm, not, I'm up here higher than you, but I'm not preaching down to you. I'm working on this myself. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others. How? Above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the the same mindset as Messiah Jesus, who being in very nature did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And others, when, when God came down as a baby, he left all that God stuff behind. He had no creepy supernatural powers. Everything Jesus did in his life, he did the same way you and I can do it, through the power of the Holy Spirit. That was it. But he didn't just come down to be like one of us. He, he came down to be the lowest of us. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself to become obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all other names. I don't know, I might be wrong on this, but I don't think most churches and most Christians today even come close to this model. And I'm including 
cornerstone and myself in this. This is like a super high bar. Most of us are stuck in an overpower model. And at best, we're trying to level the playing field, but it's not good enough. So I'd like to end today by taking communion together. You should have a creepy communion cup by you. I'm hoping we're at a place we can just go back to eating real matzah and real wine. I made a post while I was sick. I probably shouldn't have done it, but it had a graphic that says, love everyone, no exceptions. And I have a really good friend who wrote a comment that said, what about serial killers and uh, cannibalists? (laughs) I said, good try, but no exceptions. And we got into this little discussion. So if you go on, it's on my, um, I want to say it's on, we did it on Facebook, but it could be on Instagram. It's on Facebook. And um, in the end, I said, well, who gets to decide where to draw the line? Jesus said to love everyone as we love ourselves. And just if we didn't get it, he said, love your enemies too. Just in case you wanted to have, you can draw your line somewhere. So I said, who would you want to love? I mean, I don't like your lines. Serial killers and cannibalists can't be loved. Would you want Adolf Hitler to draw the lines? Would you want me to draw the lines? Would you want any pastor to draw the lines? This is really radical stuff that God's teaching. And I don't think, and I, 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 I said, do you think that Jesus like, had his hands behind his back with his fingers crossed when he said that? Do you think he said, said this the same way, that he didn't really mean that we should lower ourselves to lift others up above ourselves? I think he meant it. I think this is something we have to take to heart and really work on. So I, I invited the prayer team to come up here because we're going to take communion and have a closing song. And um, If you're like me, you need, we need help. And not just help from friends, I mean like help from the Holy Spirit to be able to take this from, okay, I can see it with my eyes, but I don't know how to make that work in my heart. It's not something you can do on your own. It's, it's, it's a supernatural work to be able to have your eyes opened. My prayer today was, coming into this, was open our eyes just to the different power models. Let's just be aware that there are, there are models out there that aren't helpful. And then let's see your power model, God. Because when God created the world, he included a world that's governed by power in human relationships. Like it or not, you have power. As a parent, as a boss, as a student, we all have different levels of power. And this underpower is supposed to fit all those models for us. So let's take the bread first. This is all based upon God doing this for us first. How many times have I said God never asks us to do anything that he doesn't do first? He lowered himself. When he came to earth incarnate, He came to the lowest position of humanity. But that wasn't low enough because he went to the cross and took upon him all the sins, past, present, and future, upon his shoulders so that he could take them from us. That's what this is. This is the power. This is the power of Christ in us to be able to do something as revolutionary as lowering ourselves the same way. Let's eat the bread.
if you can open the cup. He shed his blood. That's what this represents, the shed blood of our Messiah, which opens a way for a new covenant for us through faith. Let's drink. Savior say the strength indeed is small. I, think I forgot to say you'll be a child of weakness. Watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. Long to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow.
and left a crimson stain. He was the last. Praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the grave. Oh, praise the one. Build it back up, guys. I know we're over time, but I can't help myself. You ready? From the top of your lungs, from the bottom of your heart. our Messiah, the one who was and is and is to come, the one who flips things absolutely up to, and Jean has something to say here. Okay, keep going. Just want to Amen. <laughs> hey, I totally forgot something important. Christy will be at the visitor table if you want to know more about the Colorado Immigrant Justice Fund. She'd love to talk to you about it. God bless you. Live low. <laughs> See you later, guys. That's Serious this time, done. Get out of here.